Hello, friends, and welcome to the Friday Conversation. This week, I'm very excited to talk to author Alka Ray. Alka, thank you for making time for me. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, it's uh, we just we were just chatting about time zones, and we're on different sides of the world, so it's great to to be able to make these kind of things happen. Definitely a plus of technology. <laughs> yeah, for all for all the negatives, there's lots of positives too, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, there really is. Definitely, yeah. So your 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 latest book was released uh, on the 14th, just a few days ago. Uh, what can you tell us about it? So it is called A Friend Indeed, and it is about two women, two old childhood best friends. And one of them calls up the other in the middle of the night, um, asking her to come over, and she needs a huge favor. And uh, it's basically about how far you would go for your best friend. Hmm. What, uh, what, what's, what, what was the spark that ignited this story in your mind when you began writing it? So I saw a meme um, on social media <laughs> um, <laughs> some years ago. And it was basically, you know, it was these two women in antique dress. And one, the caption was something like, you know, best friends will help you hide the body. Hmm. Um, and so, of course, I thought, well, who would I help? And the very first person who came to mind was my best childhood friend. Um, and, of course, the next question was, well, why? You know, like, if, if your friend needed help to hide a body, there'd have to be some really good reason. My, you know, my best childhood friend wouldn't be killing someone just for the, for the fun of it. Um, so <laughs> what would that reason be? And, you know, it, that's how stories happen. You, um, you start with an idea and then it's like, what if, what if, what if? Um, and that led me to these two characters who obviously are not me and my best friend. Uh, <laughs> Our husbands are alive and well. So. Oh, okay. So it's not based on true events or anything. <laughs> no, okay. I, I would be in jail. <laughs> okay. And it's, I'm always interested to hear when, when you work on a book and it takes a long time to write it and to edit and it does a, a lot that goes into a book. What does it feel like coming up to the release date after all that work and energy and time? What are, what, what goes, what's, what are the feelings that you go through during a book release? So I think the optimism goes up and down by the day, if not the hour. And it's, it's definitely hugely exciting. You know, this was my first ever hardcover, mm. um, my first audio book. This is my first book that sort of has gotten traction. Um, so that has been absolutely wonderful. But it's also surprisingly stressful, um, not because I worry about bad reviews or anything like that. I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm past that. Um, hmm. I, I like this book. I feel confident about it. And, you know, if people don't like it, that's normal. I, there are plenty of books out there that I know are good, well done books that I don't necessarily love. So I have no, uh, you know, problem with that, but it's stressful just because, I don't know. Like there's, I guess you feel pressure as an author to do the best job possible for the publisher and for all of the people who work so hard on the book, because it really is a team effort. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of other people who put so much energy into this book and I just want to do my best for all of them. Yeah. It's so fascinating to me what that must be like to, and one of the, uh, one of the other authors I've spoken to Richard Nell, he said, it's, it's almost like telling a joke and then waiting for months for the applause. It's weird. <laughs> Years, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Years. Years. Yeah. Um, so I have a really good friend who is a singer. Like she's a quite a, a famous pop star in Vietnam. Hmm. And I always thought she's so lucky because she goes on stage and she sings and she connects with the audience instantly and, you know, you can just feel everyone's energy getting into it. And um, 
right there. Whereas an author, it's literally you're just in a room by yourself for years. And maybe a couple people like, you know, read it and like it. And that gives you some hope. But it's such a slow, slow process. Yeah, it's very seems like a very solitary process too. like you said, you're in a room by yourself and it's hard. It's and then once once the book is released, it's available for anyone to read. I think now technology has really, really helped that just because here I am in a small fishing village, like by the beach in Vietnam, kind of, I really isolated and through technology, I'm able to connect with people all over the world and have some sense of community. So that really helps. And I resisted being on social media for years, um, just because I, I'm, you know, I think like most, a lot of writers, I'm an introvert and quite shy, and it didn't feel natural. But it has really, really helped me to kind of build a community with other writers and people in that community. And that is so encouraging. Did you, uh, do you have a writing group that you're in or, or someone to kind of bounce ideas off of? I do. I I have a couple. I'm really lucky. You know, where I live, there is an older um, mystery writer who had quite a lot of success. And she sort of took me under her wing and Mm. mentored me, um, which helped a lot. And then my agent is actually incredibly hands on. Like he's uh, he loves rewrites. So. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. For, for good and bad. Yeah. That's another. That's another thing I wonder about because I I would imagine you feel a little bit possessive and a little bit like personal, like a connection to what you create, and then someone comes in and wants to change things, or you know, for the better. Um, ho- hopefully, for the better. But what is that like to receive feedback and to to be asked to change things that you may even you may really like. Um, Well, I'm sort of going through that right now for what I hope will be the next book. And I think that it's all about following your instincts. And usually when criticism, first of all, is a huge gift. You know, I think that is the turning point for me when I stopped feeling uh, personally, personally attacked by criticism and just really saw that as a huge gift. Because Hmm. if people just say, oh, I love it, they're not actually giving you anything. Um, If they're giving you feedback, it's something you can work with. Hmm. But you, you know, it has to resonate in your gut with the vision that you think you can uh, accomplish. Like those characters become real to you. And if suddenly they're being asked to do things that just feel out of out of character, it's just not going to work. It's going to fall flat. So I think it's about really being honest with what you can do and can't do. Um, But being open to those suggestions and letting it mull around and not straight away saying no. Yeah, that would be I would imagine that would be a little little weird at first to to feel so personal with something and and uh, change it. But you're right about feedback, and it's something that I know I would ha- I would struggle with with uh, reading negative reviews. And but I, I think you have to almost have that attitude of taking the feedback and and try to use it to you know improve. Yeah, you know I think that there's some reviews where it's a lot more about the person who's reviewing than it is about the product they're reviewing. Um, You know, like there's those people who are like, well, I hate thrillers and this is a one star thriller. (laughs) It's like, well, okay. You know, I mean, that's just not helpful. But that, that, I guess what you get out of that is it tells you something about human nature. Um, But there are a lot of really helpful reviews out there. And especially if it's someone who you respect in the industry. I mean, definitely pay attention. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, I'm friends. I, I'm, I guess you could say I'm friends with Jenny Wirtz. She's a, a fantasy author and she tells a story about when she started writing, she was receiving letters at the time and somebody wrote a really nasty review to her and really just tore her book apart. And shortly after, um, the, per, the same person wrote a, an apology letter to her saying, 
I'm really sorry because I was going through a really hard time in my life and I took it out on you. Uh, so he apologized or that person apologized. So you're right. It just depends on where that person is and in, in that, you know, in that moment when they write that review. And even when we read a book or watch a movie or listen to music, it, uh, we may be in a different headspace or may not, um, it may hit us differently depending on where we are. hundred percent. You know, I think, well, there's, you know, there is badly executed and then there's not for me. Um, and those are two different things. And most books that like are making it out to be at least most traditionally published books and more and more self-published books now, those are well executed books. Mm -hmm. So it's really, if you don't connect to it often, it's just that it's just not for you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, speaking of self-publishing, did you, did you kind of explore the, uh, the possibility of self-publishing before you, um, went with uh, an agent? You know, it's something, it just seems like it demands skills that I lack. Um, I think people who are able to do that, it's sort of like they're just running a, a small business. And I definitely can see the advantages because I think it involves less waiting. And that is probably the hardest part of traditional publishing is that, you know, it's really beyond your control, yeah. a lot of it, um, whereas self-publishing, you have a lot more control. But yeah, for now, I'm just happy with um, with my publisher. Yeah. So I hope they stay happy with me. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, the whole, and, you know, speaking of the whole process, you know, when you, you write the book and you query it or you, you pitch it and it, that's that, that whole process sounds very stress inducing. It, it sounds like a lot to, to, to try and find someone to publish it. Yeah. You know, I think that it, um, so this is my, this is my fifth book mm -hmm. and they've, the previous ones, you know, they've ranged from sort of uh, very, very tiny independent publishers to kind of middle mid-size independent um and i just in the beginning had this idea that you know you get published and then it's sort of like this steady progress and you're kind of set and that has not been the case <laughs> sadly um but this as i said you know this is my first book that is a bigger book um like got the got the hardcover, got the, it's in target, you know? So that's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. Neat. Yeah. That, that was actually the, probably the happiest moment of the whole thing when I found <laughs> it. it's in target. Well, no, it's, it's one of those things I think, I mean, I, I'm sure most authors, you know, aspire towards or, you know, would, would love to have that to see their book on the shelf in a place like that. Yeah. And I think also because I live in Asia and we don't have target, I just sort of, have this vision of Target as sort of like soccer mom heaven, and you know I am. <laughs> yeah, I guess it kind of is, right? Yeah, but it's no, that's great. That's that's wonderful. Um, I, I guess you know the next question would be like, when did you start writing? What 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 kind of um, inspired you to start writing? Not only just for yourself, but to for to get it published. So it depends how, you know, how long you want that answer to be. I, I had a quite unusual childhood. My dad was a, um, a gold exploration geologist. So mm. we moved constantly kind of all over the world. And I spent a lot of time, I was an only child and I spent a lot of time like basically in a tent in the woods by myself. Mm. And uh, I had to kind of, this was before technology, you know, so I just had to entertain myself and I read a lot and I made up stories I drew. Um, so it's something I've kind of always done. And then I studied journalism. I, because I really thought, oh, I wouldn't be able to make it as a fiction author. I'll um, go into journalism. And it really wasn't the ideal career choice for me because mm. I'm super shy and hated calling people up and hassling them. <laughs> so, um, yeah. which is sort of a key part. <laughs> um, but so I eventually ended up being an 
editor. And, uh, you know, I think I've been writing fiction for now probably 25 years. Hmm. Um, and I started out in my 20s. You know, I read a lot of I read mostly literary fiction, um, hmm. kind of, you know, good, good books as in <laughs> prize winning um, and I thought I was a literary author, but my stories basically just rambled around and went nowhere and didn't have a lot to say. <laughs> so luckily, I eventually kind of got addicted to crime fiction. Hmm. And um, that, that that just suits me a lot better. I, I really like a story that has something to say, but also has a strong plot and a lot of momentum. And I, I need that mystery to kind of pull me forward. Hmm. I want to I want to pick your brain about mysteries here in a second, but I, I wonder. You mentioned you did a lot of reading and drawing, and um, do you have a, a childhood book that you remember that um, that you really you you go back to even now, or that inspired you in some way? I mean, a lot. Like I can think of um, the the Velveteen Rabbit. I don't know mm. if you ever. I've so heard of that, it, yeah. yeah, it's this old old like English classic story. It's about this kid who has this stuffed bunny and the kid gets I don't know, some one of those old diseases like scarlet fever or something. And the bunny has the toy bunny ends up having to be burned when the kid just, you know, these old books are these are it gets dark. Yeah. And so basically the kid's toy, which is real to this kid, you know, ends up having to be destroyed because it so as not to like reinfect anyone. And then the kid ends up seeing a real bunny hopping away in the woods and, you know, thinks his toy has become real. And I get, I started to tear up just thinking mm. about it. Um, yeah. yeah the, I, I remember a lot of old books. Yeah. You mentioned about older stories being dark. It's uh, recently we, we talked about fairy tales on the podcast and the, the origins of a lot of fairy tales and it gets very dark. Yeah. Yeah. Just horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so my mom is German and you know, like those German ones, like the brothers Grimm and so were they, I think they, maybe they were Danish. I'm not sure, but, but uh, yeah, really, really some of her old books, you know, from when she was a kid, like this guy whose hands were scissors and like just really scary stuff yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah even the older disney movies like pinocchio and uh, dumbo that that even those got pretty dark uh, those old stories oh, i don't remember that i just remember when bambi's mom got shot got you know to, i think yeah. that traumatized a lot of kids yeah. i was one of them yeah it was pretty intense yeah uh, yeah it's um it's 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 pretty interesting to see how those stories have changed over the years. How now children's stories are much more kind and gentle, and then they were they can you know look something like Bambi. Um, it, it's some it's interesting to see the change in how children's stories are told. You know they are, but then there's the outliers, like someone like Neil Gaiman. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you've ever read uh, the Cemetery Book. Or the graveyard, mm -hmm. the graveyard book. I haven't. Oh, it it's one of my favorite books. So it's supposedly a kids' book, but uh, it's one of those kind of just all ages. Mm -hmm. And it opens. It it's supposed to be for eight year olds, and it opens with a whole family getting murdered. Oh, wow. I mean, it's sort of like whoa. Um, <laughs> so I think that kids, and it's about like this little boy who's ra who's raised by ghosts in a cemetery, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's fascinating and lovely story. And then even David Walliams, the British children author, I, you know, I remember one of them, which I read to my kids when they were little. Um, it was about a, a little boy who was a chimney sweep in like Victorian times and got stuck in a chimney and died. It's like, wow. okay, that's, that's pretty, pretty rough. It's pretty dark. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that kids, kids like that, or yeah, I, I think that kids have a high tolerance for dark. Yeah. They seem to bounce back much better than we adults do. <laughs> yeah. <True. Yeah. laughs> They're maybe more callous. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 
you think it'd be the you you would think it'd be the other way, but it usually isn't. <laughs> yeah, I guess they're forward looking. You know, yeah. they just yeah. Yeah, uh, but you had mentioned mysteries, and I wonder how do you craft a mystery because you want you want it to remain a mystery. You don't want to be too obvious with anything. How how do you go about crafting your stories to leave it mysterious and to keep the reader engaged? So, you know, I wish I was a plotter because my life would be so much easier. That is the dream that, you know, I would plot things out. It would all kind of, I would save a lot of time. But uh, unfortunately, that isn't usually how stories come together for me. I sort of just start out not knowing Hmm. and constantly saying what next, you know, what happened, what now? And it's that kind of um, me not knowing as well that keeps it exciting for me. Hmm. Um, And like a friend indeed, I had a vague idea where things were going, but I really didn't know. And it all just luckily came together. But there are also cases, you know, I have a bunch of 90,000 word drafts um, in my hard drive where things haven't come together. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I always wonder that, too, because I know I know um, writers often have, you know, a hard drive or a drawer full of unfinished work. Have you ever thought about going back and finishing one of those? You know, I definitely... uh, I have, and I have looked at some of them. And, you know, some of them have real potential, and I think I could go back maybe one day. But I always have, like, new ideas, too. It's, you know, there's no shortage of ideas. There's a shortage of time. So (laughs) things have to kind of feel fresh, and you have to be driven to tell that story. So you never know. Maybe, Maybe one day I'd go back. It is, it is the squirrel syndrome, right? There's always something new that captures our attention that we chase. Yeah. Well, I mean, definitely the first draft when that, that's really the kind of fun, exciting part. And <laughs> then <laughs> unfortunately there's a lot of rewriting and editing, although there is some satisfaction in polishing, you know, and, and getting it, um, getting it to the point where it reads like it looks easy. Hmm. Yeah. That's a, uh, a lot of, it's it's amazing how much work goes into just a single uh, single story. It's astonishing. I mean, there's there's no logic to it really. Like if you're getting if you were getting paid by the hour, you <laughs> should just get a job at McDonald's because yeah, yeah, you'd be making more. I'm yeah. sure by the <laughs> yeah, definitely. And when when you finished a friend, indeed, did you surprise yourself with the with the conclusion? Was it something that you kind of surprised yourself with, with how you had decided to wrap it up? Um, I, to some degree, you know, there were, there was one part of it where I actually had a different ending and then realized that that wasn't correct. And then I went mm. back to the beginning and the clues were there pretty much like in the very, very beginning, it was clear where it was meant to go. Um, But almost like my subconscious knew a long time before my Mm. conscious. And that, I mean, that's the magic of writing, right? It's almost, I don't want to sound like all woo woo, but you know, it does, it does feel a bit like it just comes from somewhere else. Yeah. It's, um, it's an amazing process. I don't, I don't know how how you all do it. (laughs) I really don't. It's It's amazing to, uh, one of the other authors I've spoken to said words are magic. And I think that's the best way to, to describe it because it's, you can do so much with just words and take people on a journey or take people or you can change someone's life with the, with the poem or a story or a book. And it's just amazing what you can do with language. True. Yeah. And it connects people. It connects people through time as well. You know, like we're still reading, stories that were written hundreds of years ago and they still have an impact. Yeah. Yeah, That's, it's amazing. Um, but one of the, the other things that caught my attention on your, on your website, under your, um, your about page was that you have a love for flawed characters. And I wanted to hear more about that because I I love flawed characters. Um, I love the, the, that gray area, but what, what draws you to those types of characters? Well, I think we're all flawed and, um, 
I, what really interests me is people's motivation. You know, that is, I'm just fascinated by how people work, especially if their choices don't seem logical. And that's why I really like crime fiction, because there is nothing really logical about committing a crime. You know, it's high risk um, and people do it all the time. So why? And it all goes back to emotions, you know, and I like flawed characters because we all have those negative emotions, you know, the fear, jealousy, anger, whatever. But in a book, you just up the stakes, you know, you make everything bigger than in real life. I mean, I really, really enjoy exploring that. How, how do you, how do you go about ex- exploring characters or, or making a character compelling or relatable in some way when they are flawed? Um, how do you, how do you m- make a, or how do you create it so the reader can connect with them, but not be too dislikable to where they can't? Well, I mean, that's the, that is the reality, you know, of even really people who are doing really terrible things, you know, they on some levels, I'm sure are likable and lovable. And, you know, like, like it can be a horrible person who's really good to their dog. Yeah. Right. They, they might be yeah. out rescuing animals. I mean, that's a wonderful thing, but you know, in the meantime, they're like abusing kids or you just, I mean, that's an extreme, but mm-hmm. you Nobody is all or the people. And if a character is too extremely bad, of course, you just switch off. It becomes a caricature. And um, it's about having characters who are relatable and who are like you and like people you admire, but are maybe doing something they really shouldn't be doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I love characters that are flawed and that we can you can relate to because when a character is is just so um, defined as, you know, good or bad. They just aren't very compelling for me. I need something, something to latch onto, something to make them feel real, like they're real people. Same. Yeah. If someone is just a straight through and through hero, um, that they become flat. Yeah. I, I, I guess I can, I can kind of see the, the comfort in that, I think it's almost becomes like a comfort food where you, that, you know, everything is well-defined and I think it, I know some people find comfort in knowing that the good guy will always win and the bad person will always lose. And, mm-hmm. But it's just kind of boring for me. <laughs> it's, 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 I, I like to explore, like you said, different characters and motivations and to get in someone's head and to, and to feel that tension when they do something bad and you, you have a connection to them and you, you can, you almost see them going down a, a bad path that, um, kind of see them spiral. Yeah, absolutely. But I think one of the, the benefits or the comforts of mystery and thriller is that there's a resolution at the end. Hmm. Um, and I think that is very comforting to people. And, you know, in, in real life, tragedies often don't have a resolution. Um, and That's true when you read a thriller, you, you know that that is going to, you're going to at least find out why. And that brings a lot of comfort to people. Um, and there are consequences, but I think it's about having those consequences not always be what people expect, what readers expect. So there has to be some kind of justice, but maybe it's not necessarily, you know, them getting hauled off to jail or I, you know, no, it, it's, um, but I think there do have to be consequences for a story to feel satisfying to readers. Hmm. And I, I always see thrillers almost, almost similar to how I see comedies because comedies have a certain cadence and a certain, you have to kind of build to those moments. Is, is it the same with, with writing a thriller to have kind of a, a cadence or a rhythm to, to build those tension filled moments or to build to those big events? Well, according to my agent, yes. Okay. Unfortunately, I am I sort of work by instinct. So, I'm not systematic about it. But if I analyze what works, he's right. It is falling into those rhythms. 
Well, I, I think I would I would imagine that having your your instinct would be almost like you know plotting it out in a way in your mind because if you feel the tension within you as you're creating the crafting the story, then I think it would work for the reader too because it's almost a natural thing that you're creating and taking the reader on a journey with. So I think that's kind of the same, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's all about having that momentum, mm-hmm. you know, keeping that like what's next, what's next yeah. going. Yeah, it's, do you, um, I know you mentioned that you're, you're not a plotter, but do you have the characters in mind when you, when you start a story? Do you have kind of, uh, or do you just start from scratch and let it go? I mean, hundred percent. I, you know, I have characters in mind. The characters really, um, you know, like for instance, with friend, um, there was the, well, would I help my friend, you know, get rid of a body. And then pretty soon it's like, okay, you've got one friend starts talking, the other friend, you know, and it's all about the voices of those characters and sort of just turning them loose. Um, Mm. And I would say it's almost like, you know, if you're driving in the countryside and you are flicking the dial of the car radio and like, you know, it's static and then a station comes in um, it's like listening to that station mm. um, and seeing where the characters go. And then, of course, at some point, you are going to have to get more logical and see that everything fits together and works. Mm. Um, but that's kind of maybe the later draft. Mm. And since you since you are crafting, uh, you know, these these types of stories, do you absorb a lot of crime or true crime? Material? I really do. I am secret addict um and there's you never really need to make anything up because there is just no limit to people's craziness and you know (laughs) any story out there that you think oh that uh, there's a lot of things that in fiction you couldn't write it because people would say oh there's just no way but you will find it on a true crime podcast (laughs) that someone has done it you know, true, true crime seems to be very popular the last I don't know, several years. What do you think that is generally why people are drawn to those types of stories? You know, I might be wrong, but I think a lot of the people drawn to those stories are women. Hmm. Um, I think it's especially popular with women. And I think it, unfortunately, you know, we live in sort of a uncertain world and there's I think people get one a sense of if you listen to this you might find a way to stop it from happening to you or someone mm. you love um feeling and then i think it's also that we are interested in other people and interested in sort of the the limits of human behavior mm. and this is you know, pretty far out there on the spectrum of human behavior. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, I think you have a good point there about um, kind of almost like you're studying to, to be more aware of what to look out for or warning signs or potential dangerous situations to, so you yourself can stay out of them too. And I think that really that's what fiction does as well. You know, it, um, I don't want to say inoculizes us, but like it just expands our understanding of humanity and ourselves. Mm -hmm. And as far as your, your true crime secret addiction, (laughs) I won't tell anyone, but um, do you have a a certain sub genre or a certain type of true crime that you enjoy more than others that you're drawn most to? So I like long format, you know, sort of um, that I'm thinking of a, Someone Knows Something, it's Canadian, really interesting. Um, Phoebe's Fall, you know, things that are multi-episode looks, not really just too shallow. Um, There's a wonderful short episode podcast called Women in Crime, where it's two, I think they're criminologists or sociologists, and they look at kind of... uh, how crimes impact women. There can be women perpetrators, women victims, uh, just 
women even prosecutors. Um, and that's really interesting because they're looking at it sort of from a societal angle. Um, and yeah, so I, I guess I just like how, I like stories about how crimes impact communities and the broader picture. Uh, you're adding to my podcast list as you're, as you're naming these <laughs> off. I'm going to have to check them out because it sounds really interesting. The kind of the deep dives of, um, you know, the getting into the, in, into their heads and to, to examine it, not only of, of the case that they're discussing, but how it, the reflection on society and, and just life in general, how it kind of, how it all fits and kind of trying to break it down and make sense of it. If you can. I mean, mm. yeah. There's, um, a really, there's a lot of really good Australian true crime. There's this one mm. called The Teacher's Pet, um, which is fascinating and totally infuriating. Mm. Um, and then there is another one I really recommend, which is called, um, it's a BBC, oh, Death in Ice Valley. It's mm. Norwegian. Norwegian and the BBC, they put together this really interesting podcast about a um a death way up in the mountains in norway oh wow so wow. yeah some really good international ones out there oh nice and uh yeah i'm gonna have to add those to my list <laughs> check those out for sure it's great stuff um, I, I guess speaking of audio and podcasts um what was it like to have your book turn into an audio book what that must that that must be what is it like to hear someone else reading your book Super exciting. Yeah. Um, really great. And they, the publisher, they let me help choose the narrators, um, which was very hard because they were all amazing. Um, but I got to chime in and yeah, it, really exciting to hear that come alive um, through a different artist. Yeah, that must be that must be, it's almost like seeing your book on the shelf at Target is, is having an audiobook. I, I would imagine that would be just a whole nother level of excitement to have that actually available for people to listen to. Yeah. And I mean, now I think, well, I've started listening to a lot more audiobooks lately. Um, and I think a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a great uh, product. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know I have some friends who are, you know, vision impaired and they can't read, so they depend on audiobooks. So that's, it's great when there's that option available. Yeah. Um, for the, um, for the, um, I forgot what was the question. <laughs> I lost it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to, uh, my brain went dead there for a second. But I was going to ask you about audio and music. Do you listen to music while you write? I don't. Hmm. I um, am really noise averse, hmm. which I, re I just really need it to be quiet to be able to hear those voices in my head. And I actually usually talk. I usually speak the words out loud as I write them, um, making me like I would be a horrible roommate, <laughs> basically. Um, so, yeah, I just... If you can't say it smoothly, then there's something wrong with the writing. Um, so that really helps me to just say it out loud as I type. Yeah, I've heard a lot of a lot of authors tell me that that when you read it out loud, it takes it's sometimes it, it may look good on paper, but it doesn't make sense when you read it out loud. It just has just not quite right until you read it aloud, and then it makes more sense. Yeah, it makes more sense, and also. Um, it gets rid of sort of, um, well, extra words and stilted writing. And it, if it's not natural, it'll trip you up when you speak it. So I know you need uh, kind of quiet when you write. Do you have a, a, like an environment or a, kind of a ritual that you create to have a certain environment when you sit down to write? Uh, I just anywhere quiet. You know, I have a, a little office upstairs. Um, Vietnam is not a quiet place in general, mm. I have to say. Like there's, <laughs> you know, um, there's karaoke like in the neighborhood or uh, there's like loud motorbikes. I don't mind sort of background noise, but if it's something with words, like music with words um, or conversations I can listen into, I'll just end up eavesdropping. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, quieter is better. <laughs> yeah. 
So the uh, I know we were I know you were wondering if we would have enough to talk about, and we're already uh, we're coming up on forty minutes. But uh, wanted to ask you a few more questions um, that I like to ask all of my guests. Uh, the first one is: Do you have a a favorite family recipe? Oh, I don't cook. Oh. So, um, <laughs> you know, I've lived in Vietnam for almost thirty years, and basically, you know, my whole adult life has been here. And I've always had a housekeeper, which is just like has basically saved my life and <laughs> the lives of my children. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not a good i I can make sandwiches or salad. Um, or it, it can be a dish that someone else makes that you really enjoy, or just um, just a dish that you just keep coming back to. So one thing I can do is I can bake, mm. um, and I make shortbread. Uh, which is very, very simple. It's really hard to mess up because you just throw like as much butter as you can find in there and it's, uh, it's bound to be delicious. So yeah, shortbread. Well, I'm, I'm with you on not being able to cook cause I, I mess up a bowl of cereal, so I can't cook either. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm with you on that one. Uh, the other question is, was there ever a hobby or thing that you were excited to try, but when you tried it, you did not enjoy it? Oh, um, hmm. Well, I tried to surf because I live right by the beach. And yeah, no, definitely not, not my forte. You know, I balance has never been my strong point. So um, it looks beautiful when people can do it. And my husband surfs. Um, but uh, yeah, not for me, sadly. Yeah. yeah. I swim. I swim, you know, and <laughs> stay nice, close to the surface. I'm okay. Yeah. Surfing looks like one of those activities that is, it looks really fun, but when you're actually doing it, it's not so much, it's not so much fun, but it looks, it looks neat. I think it's hugely fun if mm -hmm. you are able to relax and, you know, get into it and get good at it. And, and like, especially like small kids, they're just naturals, you know, and it's really fun for them. It's like skiing or anything. Um, I think, yeah, I just don't have good enough balance and was just get too anxious and fall off. You know? <laughs> yeah, That would be me too. Um, so the next question is what was your first job and what did you learn from that experience? Oh, wow. Um, so when I was 14, I got a job after school at my best friend's mom's lawyer's office. She was the, the mom was a lawyer and she was, it was the first all women law firm in Western Canada. And it, I just remember like all these, this was back like in the eighties, you know, and a lot of women were still getting really bad deals on divorces. And I just remember these like women coming into the office, like, you know, crying and and these lawyers were like trying to basically help them to get a better deal. Um, and yeah, that that really made a an impact on me. But I was like the worst employee. Like I would um, they had this massive photocopier and I would just randomly press buttons. And the next thing, you know, like 300 copies of like something would just shoot out. And I was constantly like shoving all this paper down, you know, my clothes and like into my bag and hauling it out and hiding it like out back. I just, I'm sure I cost them a fortune. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm terrible with copiers too. I, I'm a mess with copiers. Just, they're just so large and cumbersome and just a mess. So actually just technology in general, like no one should, no one lets me near it because uh, things go wrong. Yeah. So the, uh, the last question I have for you that I like to ask my guests is if the roles were reversed and um, you were in my position, was there a question that you would have asked that I did not ask? Oh, I would be asking way more about you, but oh. uh, I would, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm nosy. So yeah, I would just like to know, you know, how you got into doing this podcast. Oh, um, well the, um, I had a, a, I had a YouTube channel that I've kind of gone more towards podcasting now, but I, I read a book, um, by Jeff Lane. He's a self-published author. He, um, he narrated his own audiobook, and I, 
I kind of became friends with him and I just asked him one day, do you want to sit down and, and just talk? And we sat and talked and um, just had a really great time just talking and just here, you know, picking his brain. And I just love hearing people's stories and what they've been through and how they've overcome challenges or so it, it just inspires me and it's, I've just been doing it ever since. <laughs> so yeah, it's just been, um, it's been a fun journey for sure. That's awesome. Thank you so much for um, oh. including me. Of course. Yeah. Anytime. And uh, if someone wants to connect with you, uh, where's the best place to find you? Uh, I have a website, which is elkaray.com, um, E-L-K-A-R-A-Y.com. Um, and I, of all social media, I like Instagram the best. Um, I have a kind of good community there and like to talk about books and writing and life. So definitely look me up there. Awesome. And you can purchase uh, a friend indeed on Amazon or any of the major uh, sites, right? Yep. It's up there. Yeah, at, the, at the time of the, uh, at this episode goes live, it'll be available. So be sure and go uh, get a copy and, and check it out, leave a review. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again. And I uh, hope to, hope to talk again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, have a good, I guess, evening where you yeah. are. Yeah. Have a good morning where you are. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks again. All right. Bye, Steve.